Hello, I'd like to welcome you to Techspressionism Roundtable number four. Today's date is July 10, 2024. This is actually the second roundtable on this subject of science and art. My name is Michael Pierre Price, and I'm an artist out of Phoenix, Arizona. With my background in physics, mathematics, and theoretical astrophysics, this subject of art and science is near and dear to my heart. I'd like to welcome our artists today. I'm really impressed by their diverse backgrounds and the kind of art that they're doing, merging science with art. Artists on today's panel are Steve Miller and Moritz Albrecht. And we're going to follow roughly the same format that we did in our previous roundtable. Each of the artists on today's panel will have roughly seven minutes to make their presentation to introduce themselves and the art that they make. Then we're gonna to go to a series of questions and have some good discussions on this topic. And then we'll do a final wrap up with our concluding thoughts. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce our first uh, artist on today's panel, Steve Miller. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the invitation, the kind invitation, and great to see Moritz as well. And um, let's see how we go here. Mm -hmm. How are we looking? Good. All right. Um, I'm doing a kind of a uh, an overview of technology, and uh, it's going to be a lot of years at a short period of time. And um, I kind of put the dates in the lower right hand corner for people to see, you know, both my progress and and the thinking about technology over the years. So I was reading a lot of French post structuralist theory, you know, Foucault, Roland Barthes, uh, Jean Baudrillard, and it really got me thinking about visual languages of the epoch in which we live and there's this new thing that happened uh, in the early 80s and it was this universal barcode and um at the time you know uh it really felt like it might change the way we do business like is this thing going to work and you started to see it appearing you know in grocery stores and things like that and obviously it was successful and I really thought it would have something to do with about how we think about labor, how technology changes relationships, which we all know through social media. And I was starting to look at, you know, computers and how computers could change the way we look at an image and where you got those images from. This is a mapping from an ICBM warhead missile that, you know, looks at the landscape, right? That's the digital version of the landscape is this missile is going to go wherever it goes. And I, I really like the idea that, you know, the landscape is going through also a transformation. So all of culture was like changing quickly. And one of the other things I was thinking about is, is that technology is so, in some level, dispassionate, and we're going to talk more about text expressionism and emotion. And I was thinking, what kind of images could I use that might actually be um, have an emotional response? And so I took Herman Rorschach's test, I digitized it. Here you see it on an Apple computer, and I started silk screening these ink blots on canvas, and you know. The idea was that if these images actually do involve, you know, do you see the bear? Do you see the two women facing each other? Do you see the face? Had something to do with your, you know, the emotional content of the message and and also this sort of tabula rosa that the viewer is now being uh, interrogated in a certain kind of way. And, you know, once I started thinking about the Rorschach blots, I, I started thinking, well, you know, the small set, the unhealthy set of a Rorschach blot is the people that are, have a pathological problem. Like instead of seeing the dancing bear, they see two people with knives murdering each other. So it, it made me think about pathology and the images of pathology that we could now see through technology. So this is an electron microscopic view of two white blood cells that are HIV positive, And you can see they're sort of sticking together 
there's sort of a bridge connecting them. And, and normally those blood cells are bouncing around the your body like golf balls, you know, they're hitting each other. But when the cell structure becomes weakened, they touch each other, they glue together, they pull apart, and you've just had two dead white white blood cells at the moment. So I was looking inside the body using electron microscopic images. And then technology and painting are always in a conversation together. And, and one of those conversations always is painting is dead, right? And I started to think, well, what if I could go look at genres of painting and and think about ways that technology could change that? So this is actually a Rorschach blot in the background with uh, MRI slices, CT scan slices of my therapist, who was the head of a psychiatric hospital in New York, a guy named William Frosch. So, you know, the idea that through the lens of technology, you could see the world differently is something really compelling. So I did his portrait. This is a genetic portrait I did in 1993 of a woman named Isabel Goldsmith, um, who was a, a wealthy um, um, English collector who uh, her father was James Goldsmith. And I convinced her to let me do her genetic portrait. So he grabbed her blood and, you know, and autoclaved it. You can see. Uh, is my pointer showing at all? Yes. Okay, so here you see the you know the matching chromosome pairs, right? Those are two pairs right there. Now you can see the chromosomes are these are like connected, right? They're just about to break off and form new pairs, which is you know mitosis, a classification of chromo chromosomes. But it was just this idea that technology could could change the way we look at the world and introduce a new visual language system. So this is actually a cell portrait. As you can see, it's all the blood vessels in my brain. And you can see my name in the upper right-hand corner. Um, and this was another kind of painting genre called Vanitas. And it's sort of a, a type of still life with a morality play. So I, I like that idea. And then I had the opportunity to go to Brookhaven Labs and um, be invited to work there. And one of the people that was working there was uh, a guy named Rod McKinnon, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in nineteen in 2003, by the way, there's the date, while we were working together. And he figured out how the electricity in the body worked, which is ions crossing cell membranes, which will be relevant to that notion of electricity and the slides that are coming forward. But what they do is they shoot a proton beam through a crystallized lattice work of frozen protein and they can those those beams the protons go through the lattice work they leave a bunch of dots on a screen and through different algorithms you can pull those dots forward and create these 3d models helix models surface models uh in this case bubble models and mm -hmm. it was just a way to you know look at how science is is changing the health industry and also really physically how the electricity inside the body you know the body's working so then now we're in brazil and you see these electrical lines and i did this project called health of the planet and the idea was that if the lungs of the amazon are um you know the lungs of the planet then i could give brazil a theoretical medical checkup by x-ray in the flora and fauna which you'll see later so one of the you know, what happens in this, you know, leveling of the Amazon is that all that stuff is being used, you know, for uncontrolled development. And these are the wires that kind of represent the energy that I found in the poorest sections of Brazil, which you'll see later. Again, this is x-rays of live animals um, uh, and getting the idea of this new tableau of looking at the lungs of the planet and recognizing the fragile beauty. Mm -hmm. And Part of the, you know, I saw I get into a kind of a very close eyed look. And then you see on the right side of this painting, a green line. These are satellite images of Amazon land clearing. So they 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 put a road in like this, right? Going down here. And then they clear off the road. So these are, there's a road and then they're clearing off the road here. Another road, you can see um, what's going on in the Amazon through these satellite images and taking a kind of a holistic approach to the earth. And I was fortunate to be invited to the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva 
in um which is CERN, which is uh, where they're looking for elementary particles of of the quantum universe. So I spent over the course of a couple of years, a few weeks there with these guys. And I was really interested in thinking about, well, what was the next visual vocabulary that would come into the culture? And it's, you know, it's quantum physics. This is the actual collider with a silk screen of some of the chalkboards from the scientists. But you could this this collider, this big circle right here is eight stories across. You might get the scale by looking at these railings that humans would hold. This is the beam line going across. And so they bring these two sections together and then they fire up the reactor. The particles go through all of these different uh, uh, panels where they figure out the electrical charge of the particles that are colliding with each other. And they found something not relevant to the discussion, but a, a, a particle called the Higgs boson, which is a particle that helps the other particles of the universe understand what their mass is. So if we get to that, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> but this is underground at CERN and the complexity and the new kind of visual universe of technology that just really grabbed my my ideas and information. And then I was lucky to spend time in the favela in Rio. And it's, that's another story, how you get in there. You have a bodyguard that like tells you when you can shoot photographs. And so those wires in the background are kind of this really chaotic, uncontrolled growth. And it's also, I thought there were beautiful drawings and this helix a structure is one of, uh, it's a, a mesh model of, of, uh, Rod McKinnon's imaging from the Nobel Prize. And I thought, okay, this is the electricity inside the body. And then you've got this chaotic use of, of uh, how electricity is, is, is needed within the visual culture. And these are the, the abstract forms you're seeing here are the uh, areas of Amazon land clearing seen from a satellite, different patterns that they make in the salmon color and the yellow, and then the wires of the universe in the background. And then I started thinking about low energy, high energy physics. This is a chalkboard from CERN with some of the wires in the favela. And the idea I was thinking was that human behavior is not going to change, but maybe there's a possibility that science would help offer these solutions. So, um, this is in the favela in in uh, Rio. And now we're looking at uh, the Large Hadron Collider. You can see the the image that we saw before on the top of the background that's now black and white in a Nobel Prize winner's office below, but sort of combining, you know, research and, and an idea that maybe the quantum universe of the future will help us. So now we're back to the favela and um, with with sort of the whole history of energy, the helix being, you know, the energy inside the body, the culture of, of using energy and then high energy physics that might give us a shot at the future. And this is just the last slide. So I, I did a book um, with Neil deGrasse Tyson and it was called Surfing the Cosmos. And, you know, it was sort of like kind of stepping way back and understanding where we are in the universe. And so, and these are the chalkboards from CERN, some of the solutions that might come from science and, and bringing this into my painting practice as a, a new content uh, for discussion. Thank you. Wow. That's a lot to take in and unpack, Steve. It's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, after Maritz's presentation to, to discussing some of that. So thank you so very much. Okay, so uh, following up from Steve's presentation, we now have Moritz Albrecht. Uh, Moritz, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, thanks uh, first, Michael, for setting this up. It's a great honor to be here, talk with you and talk with Steve about uh, two realms which are very crucial to me. So I'm a radiologist at first, and on the science part, I published, for instance, 138 papers. One was uh, in radiology, a first authorship, which is our highest journal, 
The second authorship in the England Journal of Medicine was a, a, another important milestone. So I really had significant work on this side, but also on the artistic side. So uh, I founded a project, radiologyart.com. It's a website which serves as an online gallery, which uh, displays radiology art from all over the world, from various artists. So um, right now there are 24 artists featured overall, and uh, it's a great pleasure to also curate this in order to stimulate the radiology art movement a bit uh, more uh, as a new branch of modern uh, digital art. And uh, there's also an Instagram uh, related to this artsy radiology. So I'm very into this radiology art uh, matter and uh, it interferes a lot, which you see here also. They are very comparable, maybe art and science in general. Um, and um, you see art uh, on the other hand, like my preference is slightly towards art, but uh, yeah, otherwise I am an, also an abstract painter. I do other digital art than radiology art and installation art. So let's start and uh, with the first uh, piece I wanna show, it's a preview from the exhibition Hello Brooklyn, which is upcoming in a few weeks and uh, it's happening in Brooklyn. Uh, I call this a dynamic variety. So first uh, there's an abstract uh, acrylic painting in the background, I photographed it and then I superimposed computer tomography images from a lemon shark. And uh, what I think is always important to say is that I didn't make uh, any further editing, but the radiology software realm. So there's no filter or no Photoshop or something. It's really um, a drawn or colored by traditional radiology techniques. We call this in radiology centering and windowing. It's normally on the grayscale to make the image brighter or less intense and so on. But when you, uh, uh, use the software and exploit it in a way that was not actually intended, you can come up with very nice images with also like a shadings and so gradual differences. Um, and uh, clinically, this doesn't make so much sense to, uh, to, uh, to color everything. But of course, from the artistic way, there are endless capabilities. And in many radiology softwares, the features are hidden. But when you search for it, um, but uh, it's always for me interesting that not, not so many people use this actually, but it's there. So you can start uh, very easily actually, but you just have to know the software a bit better. And uh, what I wanna say with that is like that the shark is uh, always the same, but uh, on the spectrum from all these colors also, diverse, like also what we humans are in the end equal, but also very on the spectrum different. And uh, we should stick together, especially in these times, and also be maybe less gentle sometimes to fight for uh, the issues that the world is facing right now. And that's why I choose also the shark. And all this thing is kind of going um, from uh, the left to the right. This was an important uh, piece, serotonin, for me. And uh, in general, that's where I had this idea about, okay, there is a radiology art um, uh, possible also with CT images, like, uh, of course, X-ray uh, art is a major part of radiology art, but with CT, for instance, here you see always in CT, this beautifully uh, volume rendered um, surface uh, reconstruction. And so the human heart, it's flipped like, uh, like the heart emojis. And then you have the ventricles, the atria. And this was very complicated to get in this photorealistic life-like visualization. It was a prototype software with, that a friend of mine, we manipulated this and uh, modified it a lot and came up with this colorful combinations and still, it should, it is supposed to give this impression of a beating heart in joy status, like euphoria or like uh, other positive feelings which would re uh, release serotonin, which is like uh, one of the so-called um, happiness hormones, like dopamine is the uh, second most common. And um, when you see here, it's 
also an effect. Of course, this looks nice, beautiful. First, I, uh, you could say it's pop art or something like that, but in the end, it's just the opposite of superficial or like uh, consumption or something. This is no consumption at all. It's addressed or it's actually everybody looks like this in, in the end. So in I think it has more um, meaningfulness uh, in a way, despite that it looks so cheerful and so colorful at first glance. Like that's uh, why I like it um, a lot. And with magnetic resonance imaging, I uh, uh, imaged uh, many uh, fruits with a friend of mine, Sofia Santos, and uh, we uh, had, for instance, here, this is my favorite, it's a pomegranate. And this pomegranate is then again with radiology software is colored. It's hard to get this like shapes from red, orange to green, yellow. Um, and then with this turquoise, in the end, like this would be the surviving one from maybe a series of a couple of hundred. So it takes really long time to digitally get a feeling for this um, digital coloring with radiology softwares, since they are like actually not intended for this. But why do I think this is so important? It's because uh, you see this in the whole integrity with all radiology techniques, basically with X-ray and CT as well, but like, like to have fruits or soft tissue, you need uh, magnetic um, resonance imaging. And you could cut the pomegranate, of course, you would also get a slice, but then you there's juice coming out, there is a uh, cell is damaged and ruptured and sliced. And so in the end, a pomegranate in my perception can never be as beautiful as here because it's like not damaged and it's still in full integrity shown. This is the piece I would like to show because we're talking about science and uh, technology in general. And as a scientist also, I'm a big fan of easy bulleted sentences, like key points, like in scientific papers, like everybody understands. So I question myself what are, were actually really crucial, substantial inventions from the cheaper ones. Um, so then things like the wheel would come to mind, but a wheel is like not so interesting to, uh, to x-ray, but like lighters, I think the control of fire, like first to the production of fire is I think an evolution, a, a critical step towards uh, being humans. And then also to have this just in your pocket controllable. I mean, nowadays we are so into uh, really advanced AI and other softwares and developments uh, that we sometimes forget that actually a, a simple lighter is a great invention. And I want to simulate here the evolution of lighters from a petrol lighter to a gas lighter. And then this is from the company who has the most expensive lighters, uh, to my knowledge. And uh, you also, again, this is like, a, as I said before, you can, of course, unmount the lighter or you can Google it. How does it look on the inside? Whatever. Also for watches, like for very advanced uh, Swiss watches, for instance, the you can do that, yes, but you will always destroy the integrity and you don't see the whole. And that's the beautiful about radiology techniques that you can see through it and you see the full functionality and uh, arrangement of the also engineering that is used here. So now it's like a more recent development in my artistic uh, oeuvre. Like uh, same with radiology art, I'm like, there's the scientist in me, I guess. I always try to find new ways to express artistically as well. And it's super hard, of course, to find a new idea or a new concept. That's always the most critical part. So I was in the builder's market once and then I saw construction foam and thought, hey, let's start doing some paintings and with texture or reliefs with construction foam and gypsum, the gypsum. And um, then I was um, uh, starting. And right now it's the most important uh, work that I do, I guess. Uh, I, I do this in very large numbers because I can express a lot of things that are not graspable on earth. Like for instance here, it's, it's supposed to give an impression on the wealth of gold, which is find, found on Psyche 16, which is an asteroid 150 miles in diameter. 
it's reachable. NASA has just launched uh, a spacecraft to it last year in October, and, and now it will take six years until uh, they will get to uh, Psyche. And, and, and the spacecraft is also named Psyche. So I think um, the asteroid is completely made from metal almost. So iron, nickel, but also a wealth of gold. So there's so incredibly much gold on, on this uh, asteroid. I also put gold leaf on it, uh, not completely, uh, but there is gold uh, in, 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 uh, uh, contained. And um, when I see this also, I didn't want to make a gold jewelry effect or something. That's, I, I didn't want, of course, I want to have a raw asteroidal shape and impression. And that's one of my favorite uh, art pieces actually. And it's not a, a, that big, but the effect is, is, is wonderful. Or mercury was an element which always fascinated me. Of course, it's highly poisonous, which is uh, a pity, but uh, from the viscosity and from its behavior and how it looks like, like liquid silver, which drop like appearance, I, I was always fascinated. And then I tried to express how would it would look like to have stream of mercury or fall of mercury or a river or a, a lake or something. I mean, somewhere in the universe, it must be uh, there, this planet. We don't know yet, but um, just another example how, and it is supposed to look very extra touristic. So that was always my aim to be a bit more, uh, to, 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 that you can find this pattern so easily. On the other hand, I realized um, the tissues in radiology, they also look sometimes like this. And then when you go in the microscopic level, membranes of cells, they can also look like this. So that's a bit funny that you can go in the, uh, you can go greater in the dimension, you can go lower in the dimension. And sometimes you see a similarity. And uh, I wanna close uh, with this one. When I saw the photos from Hubble and James Webb telescope from Pillars of Creation, I was uh, fascinated from the first moment. I think this is one of the most beautiful structures I have ever seen really. And um, with the technique with the construction form, I tried to imitate it, not copy the shape, but also make a stardust formation. Like this is like you know, stardust and gas interstellar. Uh, and, and they are like stars are inside are created. And so I also tried to uh, build columns, which would be look like star uh, interstellar gas and dust. But I darkened the image a lot, like uh, this took forever, like to, to paint it and to make this a bit darker. I didn't want to make just a beautiful star image. I just want to have this, this title, Per Aspara Ad Astra, which is Latin from Seneca. Uh, it means uh, rough paths lead to the stars. And in the end, I think this is kind of permeatively coming from the background wood towards you. And it's a very interesting, uh, shape it, it it looks like nothing from the world uh, when you are in front of it so uh, these are like topics from my current work yeah and yeah with that thank you michael again i think it's fantastic that we have this session today and i'm looking forward to the other discussion now wow thanks moritz um beautiful oh man there's so many uh things that we can sort of follow some threads here. Um, and I think the first thread that I see really strongly in both of both of your works is your creative mind as an artist working with science and technology to, you know, use a very worn out phrase, you know, think outside the box here. Um, how do you see creativity as something essential, not only for science, but also for art? Um, you know, traditionally artists have been on the vanguard of new ways of thinking. Obviously, in more recent times, science is the same thing. So 
talk about just for you personally, what is it, what, what creativity within you is drawn to that sense of science and art or the merging of it or the using of it or technology? I'm just kind of curious. So whoever wants to go and try to tackle that first, uh, you have the floor. Yeah, I right, think, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead, Maurice. All right, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I, I think it's uh, very much the fuel and the motor of both fields, like to have creativity, because in, 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 in research and science, it was always interesting to see. Uh, I was relatively, I had a lot of ideas about study hypothesis. So, so these hypotheses, I could just like, if very many, uh, just like sometimes I had to do a hypothesis and to create it for the next three years for an agenda or for my entire half department. And I was like, okay, what should I do? Like, what, somehow, somehow it worked. Of course, I did not only alone, I, it was always in the research group, but I was like the head of this uh, and I was responsible. So, and um, so hypothesis was my strength. I was just like, okay. Can we do this on the other disease? Can we do this technology setting? Can we just try it out? And then it was a try and error, being experimental all the time. And for me now saying about science that this was like the most important part, uh, part it's also an art. Like what makes the revolutionary artists revolutionary? They were the first who had like a new concept and idea and, and, and thinking or like, like Picasso is seeing the world differently than others. And this is like very similar. And I can really say when I think about new um, art pieces or like what is actually meaningful, what could I do? Like, it's like, it feels completely analogous in both fields. So this is like interesting that I think that creativity and also this thing outside the box being experimental or innovative, curious curiosity is also a big uh, factor, which uh, is, 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 is true for both. Um, on the other hand, then afterwards, the conduct of the research in the scientific, in the science of, of medicine, at least, can very be repetitive, also hard work. And then you have to keep going and spend nights with writing the paper and everything. So this is sometimes very uncreative as well. Like so, and this is different from art. On the other hand, so I have thought about this a lot. And so art in the end, like, uh, of course, it's also uh, hard work and uh, there's a lot of other things in managing around, but in the end, like the creativity is always there to, in, in some extent, there's always expression and emotion and, and feeling. And, 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 and this is sometimes in, in, in science different, but again, like the diamond on both things is like the, you have to have the idea. And, yes. and this is like, um, in the end, it's in that regard, it's the same maybe, you know? Thank you. Yeah. All right, Steve. Michael. Yeah. Thanks. The uh, the question is how do these two things meet, or or how does one start on this path? Um, I guess for me, it's I, I'm really interested and intrigued by your creative process and how that ties into creativity. That's really, I think, inherent in both science and in art, and so. You can you can follow the thread however it feels. Okay, right there's a lot of threads there. For, <laughs> for you know, as I you know started out looking at that you know universal barcode in 1980, right? I made the painting in 82, but you know this idea that science and more importantly technology was invading the culture, like and you know I was doing a lot of reading and I was reading philosophy really to understand better what the function of art should be in the culture. Mm -hmm. And one of those deconstructive, you know, pathways of thinking is like breaking down structures and analyzing structures. And one of the common structures with all of us is language. Yes. And, you know, and then in visual art, there's also a visual language, just like, um, you know, Vanitas turned a still life into a morality play in the 16th century. So, you know, what, what's the function and meaning of art? And so I was reading a lot and I understood that art always had a relationship 
to the visual language of its culture. And so pop art is the visual language of commercialism and shopping and, you know, materialism and very relevant as a, as a movement. And it made me realize that there was a new language system coming down with this universal code and new signs and symbols of technology that was going to change the way we look at things and, and the computer being one of them. So that ICBM, ICBM missile mapping system was like, wow, you know, it's a it's a weapon of war and it's digitizing the landscape into a different kind of structure, just just as way Vanitas changed still life. So it was clear that technology was going to offer the opportunity to follow what the new visual language system was in our world coming up and then and it keeps morphing so that's how i ended up in cern because i had done this project with cork gluon plasma at brookhaven which i didn't put those slides up because i was doing 40 or 50 years in a few minutes but they were you know understanding um the kind of nature of the birth of the universe by understanding that, you know, the plasma state of matter at Big Bang was quarks, gluons, yeah. and um, uh, and Higgs bosons, actually. So it, it made me understand that I had to keep looking at science as a way to understand the world better. And that's kind of how I came to it. And that visual language then just invaded everything I do. So I, what, one of the things I find fascinating uh, about the work that both of you have shown today and, and knowing a little bit about what you all do, I think tied to that creativity is you both make connections that aren't necessarily obvious. And Steve, in, in your talking about the favela along with the work at CERN and about how important electricity is within the body, within the brain, uh, and then talking about how it's important in the lifeblood of us human beings and all of that. And, and then Moritz with, with your connection of the heart and, and, and being able to see inside pristinely in ways that we couldn't do with just, um, you know, the electromagnetic spectrum that we're used with our eyes. Uh, I, I find fascinating the way that you make connections. And I I don't know if you have anything else that you might want to add about that, but it's something that I find, it intrigues me about your work. And, and, and I think it goes beyond just the surface of the visuals, that there's, there's something that you can chew on, <laughs> that you can think about. And so if, I, if either one of you wants to address that at all, I'd appreciate that. Well, I'll say one thing. You know, the you mentioned the the favela in Rio, the poorest neighborhoods, and the you know this chaotic need for resources. And really, I just looked at the wires, which you see in any poor neighborhood in India. It could be anywhere. You see those, and it made me realize that it was a drawing made in space by humans out of necessity. Mm -hmm. So it was like, wow, I've got this ready made. Right. It's it's a it's a new kind of ready made that looks like a drawing. And I thought I could not make a drawing as beautiful as those wires. And you see, you know, like similar kinds of mesh networks, maybe uh, people might disagree with me, but I'm, I, I love Bryce Martin's work, especially the last work when he starts making those kind of mesh backgrounds. I guess I respond to that because that's what I use in my own work. But, you know. In art, you're always looking for imagery and and what are those images going to do? And so the superficial version of the image is, wow, there's this drawing in space made by humans. And then what's the, you know, what, what are those wires, crazy wires all about? Well, it's actually about a big problem that we have, which is uncontrolled growth and, you know, not decent living conditions and 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 they're stealing all that electricity because they need it to run their lives and then you've got the problem that it creates which is you know one aspect of global warming and then and then 
in America, sadly, this disdain for science yeah. and this disdain for logic and this disdain for fact and the Higgs boson, when they make a scientific, I mean, Moritz probably knows this better than anybody, but when they make a scientific discovery, it's 99.9%. You know, it's, it's, it's certainty that's been tested. And, you know, the idea that we do have facts and we do have conditions that can be um, understood through data and then, you know, find solutions. I mean, my thought is, can art participate in this discussion? Good. I'm, I'm there with you. <laughs> I totally agree. Ritz, do you have anything that you'd like to add? It, I think there were like some um, uh, multiple facets. Uh, what came to my mind is um, that I want to make the point that through imaging techniques of uh, that we have, X-ray, CT, MRI, I understood so much about the beauty of the human body and in an artistic way. Of course, as a med student, I was always, I knew of course about anatomy and how this looks like. And, but also it was like from, uh, yeah, it was always some anatomy. Uh, it, 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 there was not so much beauty in actually for me at least. Whereas in, in, in radiology, the nice thing is, uh, it's it's uh, of course uh, you do no harm. The um, most uh, the time we don't even inject something, so it's without any pain or something like that. And you see the living organism in all their aspects so perfectly nowadays with this technology. Also with our screens, they are way more expensive and uh, elaborate than the normal premium uh, screens for other PCs. So so you see always this. And it's very intense for me. And the more I became an artist, the more intense the uh, impressions also were, which is sometimes funny because as a clinical radiologist, I should not always see the beauty everywhere, just, just get the work done and make the accurate diagnosis and then, yeah, be fast and efficient. That's like sometimes a, a bit of pity that um, we are more about efficiency about than mm -hmm. those uh, um, uh, aspects of, of it. But for myself, like I, I see now a beauty, I, I can literally find beauty in so many aspects. Like uh, there, there's sometimes a little tree of vasculature and I think you oh, this is am amazing. You, you magnify it. Then you can say, okay, I make this in blue. And then, so it's, it's the human body is, is in, in, incredibly beautiful. And mm. normally you only see the surface and that's also how we intuitively see beauty. Um, like the first step was in uh, medical school when I first were operating and where I put my hand in someone and I was like a bit traumatized. I was really for several weeks, I, I could not be, uh, uh, yeah, with my girlfriend was a bit like I was more distanced because I, I couldn't take it like kind of. Mm -hmm. So now, but then afterwards you process it. And then as a physician, you always know what it gets more familiar. And now with this radiology art aspect, this is endless, like a, a brain scan in this high sharpness or like a cardiac, like a pumping heart and cardiac MRI. You, I think you have seen this also. Some, it, wow, yeah. So I think always this is like fantastic. And then of course, but I have to focus to be more. So it's also like what, sometimes it's competing, like like the, the scientists in me, the mm -hmm. better I was in science, the more successful, the more I decreased in my knowledge in medicine. And vice versa. And now also in art, it's the same game repeats. The more I yes. become a great artist or maybe I, I improve as an artist, the, the less I have time to study. So that's a, like a, just an issue. Also, when we talk about this interference and like correlation of both fields, art and science, uh, at a time is a crucial factor, which is holding us back from it to do them both thoroughly, you know? It's easily said, of course, everybody would be happy to be scientists and artists, and, uh, but um, I think this is like a, 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 the, the reason that uh, still it's like not that so many people uh, are active on both sides. Yeah? I mean, okay. it can be very like uh, time consuming, both is when you want to be um, really like into it, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> but it's also rewarding, uh, really, like. And... 
you guys. Oh, I I appreciate both both of your perspectives and answers. I, I know from my own, you know, from my own background, um, and and where I can relate a lot to, you know, Steve's experiences at at CERN, especially with you know some of the the equations that he had on there is that that sense of you know physicists talking about beautiful equations so there that that sense of beauty um that that's there i i i think is something really really powerful uh and and i think science and that understanding and your experiences that way can enhance that sense of wanting to share that beauty as well as an artist with others. So, so I uh, just want to chime yeah, in yeah, on, go the ahead. Word, on the word beauty, because um, the the second essay in the book uh, of Surfing the Cosmos is by a physicist, Arthur I. Miller. I don't know if you know who he is or not. He wrote um, uh, Einstein Picasso, and he's written a lot yes. of books. Anyway, he yes. wrote an essay about this subject of aesthetics and beauty, and that's the second essay in the book. And I really wanted him to write that essay because I wanted to address that concept uh, and address that in the book. Like, what is beauty and what are aesthetics? And he talks about in the essay, what you just mentioned previously is a beautiful equation. And and. Steve, having your book, and I appreciate that I got it and your autograph, that essay, I think, is profound. And I really, really found it to be very inspiring. So I'm, right, I'm, so glad, you, I'm glad you had that as part of that book, because I think it I, really enhances everything about the book that, that's in there. I was hoping that, you know, more people would, would jump on that, but, you know, He's talking about uh, Moritz, uh, an equation that um, a scientist came up with and people were uh, disproving. And then the equation was maybe maybe it wasn't a valid equation. Back to the work table, other people started testing the equation and realized that it was valid. And the remark by the scientist was, of course, it's valid. It's a beautiful equation. <laughs> So they see beauty and, you know, science, you know, mathematics, I guess, really, this is about mathematics, but there's the aesthetics are all around us. That's not necessarily just the the um, the world in fine art. Right. You have beautiful equations and and, you know, Maurice, you're looking at the heart and you're saying, wow, I'm in the body and I know I'm tearing somebody apart, but if I can get back step back a little bit i realize how beautiful it is and i i like the one thing that you did because i was going to ask you the question is that where the heart shape came from when you put that heart shape in front of the heart yeah, yeah exactly I, I, that I, is I, the know, origin I, of a heart the, the shape that we use tough. for valentine's day um yeah I, I i i i try to do this like like the heart uh that's so intuitively that one understands okay this is really like I mean, it's funny because we always send us hearts. Uh, it's a social and cultural thing. Yeah? So we don't think about, okay, this is an organ or something. But once it's like an organ, you it's like, oh, it's like something uh, more massive from the effect. Yeah? But in the end, it's like the, the same. It's like the heart. So it's a very kind of cheesy, uh, romantic thing. But in the end, like what it, when it's a real heart, it, I think it's an instinct from us that we appreciate and respect this way more than as it would be just like um the normal heart emojis or something other painted uh, i really uh, like the way you did that it was oh. just really crystal clear and i it's funny i was going to ask that question and you press the next slide it was <laughs> oh yeah here's where this is this is what it's it's about biology yeah, yeah. thank you <laughs> as much as love whatever that is yeah that's awesome yes so I think this is maybe going to be the last question I have. And I, I don't want it to sound too trivial because I think it's really profound. But if you were to fill in the equation, art plus science equals what, 
and you you don't have to give a single you know word answer. You can make it as long or short as you want to. But art plus science equals, in your experience, where you are today. What? How would you? How would you fill that in, that equation in? Either of you. All right. For me, um, you know, it's it, it equals new content, and you know, it it's like it introduces new subject matter and a new lens through which to look at the world. That's awesome. Yeah, I completely agree with your, your uh, Steve, and especially your last point. Like, I think both scientists and artists like want to investigate the world, be curious, find new forms of, in the end, understanding the world. And also improving the world. Like I think science in general, without uh, uh, with some exceptions, of course, but like in, in general, it's a very po a very positive thing. So every researcher and scientist want to do some uh, something good for the world and improve it, and and also like def finding the truth, which also artists are sharing this characteristics, I guess. So I think uh, it would be since the these characteristics uh, are similar and then there is a significant overlap in my opinion it's a form of enhancement so in the end like when you have insights on both fields it's you, you get greater insights uh, on the world how everything functions and it's just not measurable so directly in our modern society because we don't appreciate predominantly anymore this kind of multidisciplinary um uh, working or activity uh, patterns like uh, many think we always have to specialize specialize always specialize but in the end i think in like knowledge transfer and this thing outside the box like transferring an idea or another context but just you are positive you, you are able to do this because you do the other realm i think this can be uh, this is very underestimated mm. and um and then I, I I thought also, I think like with artists, I think we artists, we are more pre primarily the researchers as a previous form of the high elaborate science. So in the end, we all are doing research with our explorative art, some would just pictorial art and decorative art, but in the end, like the other artists, uh, they want to do. Uh, they want to dig some some deeper, and um, like science is even myself. Like I always said, first I was a researcher. Of course, I was scientific, and but in the end, I said like I, I led a research group. I'm a researcher, and this is also with my um, try and error approach with this experimental uh, working pattern. It's more. Um, I think it's more represented. Maybe we say research and art should merge first more, and then we can maybe the science as that's a higher uh, term can follow maybe that's what might be my idea you know michael that's just awesome. one quick insight i like relevant to this discussion you turned that last question into an equation i did well it and i i really and i purposefully did that and and it was a nice segue from talking about beautiful equations so it seemed like a good time to to throw that in there i I appreciate everything you all have said. I, I like the idea. Researchers is good. I also think we're explorers. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I think that sense of exploration is at the heart of science and at the heart of art as well. Um, so I would like to give each of you uh, a, a couple minutes, maybe any final thoughts, any new projects you might be working on. I'd love to see... Uh, let you share your screen one more time if you've got another piece you could share with us. So, um, Steve, you want to go first and and share any sure. final I, thoughts? I actually, I had an image on the screen. I did not realize um, it was part of my um, uh, proposal here. So, okay, uh, okay. So I may just opt out actually. Let's see if I stop my share. So I made it more complicated. I think I can just say that, you know, where I'm going now is thinking about 
data streams and how data streams inform how we learn about the world. And we've got them coming at us constantly. So that's the next thing I'm looking at. So do you have a specific project in mind that, that deals with that? Or is it just- Yeah, I do, I do. I, I, I've I actually uh, today, you know, went, you know, I, I'm applying for some, some support for that idea. And if I get, the, of course it involves technology and that's expensive. So um, I'm happy to be in my studio, but it's, it's great to actually bring the technology to the audience in a different kind of way. Awesome. Well, I look, I look forward to hearing more about that sometime. <laughs> How about for you, Maritz? Yeah, uh, let me uh, just share my screen real quick over here. Yeah, maybe this is actually, it was not intended now, but uh, I printed this out in 2.4 meter length. So it is like really different when you see it this in this size. And I put on like plastic PVC stones. So it's kind of a, a extension of the effect that it actually already had to be more cheerful and um, to have this positive impact. But like, Let's uh, just go back. Um, this would be like uh, my my closing. It's interesting because uh, Steve was also with, uh, talking about a stream. So uh, this could also be a stream from upward to downward. And what the point I want to make is like, I'm interested in creating and, and blending dimensions and layers. Like for some reason, I'm very fascinated about coins. I think they will be abandoned soon, which I think is a pity because every coin in the end, culturally, is already like a little artistic document of the time that it was built. Okay, so first the painting, then the coins, then like the hearts. And I like that it gets some more, um, it gets deeper, the image impression. And, um, yeah, I think I will do maybe more of this, like mixed media, like kind of um, also the other way around, like uh, print out digital art pieces that I created and then paint on them. Like uh, Steve uh, does uh, in this uh, perfect way. Like, I think this is very interesting to also make that always the distinction between digital and painting and so on. This is what uh, is really fascinating fascinating for, for the future for me. Yeah? Mm. Okay, yeah. Well, I want to thank the both of you. Um, I really appreciate your time in sharing and in being thoughtful with the questions I posed to you. And with that in mind, I'm going to sign us off. And once again, thank you to Steve Miller and thank you to Maritz Albrecht. Uh, this thank is you, Michael. The text pressure. Thank you, Michael, so much. Four. Yeah. You are more than welcome. Thank you. Adios. Bye-bye.